Monsieur le Président, comme Canadien, aujourd'hui, je suis déçu. Ce matin, le Premier ministre a finalement daigné parler à la Chambre des communes, ce lieu sacré de la démocratie canadienne, à la suite de sa décision d'invoquer la loi sur les mesures d'urgence sur tout le territoire canadien. Il avait une occasion unique pour justifier sa décision de recourir à cette loi extrême pour mettre fin à la crise qu'il a lui-même créée. Il a échoué. Il n'a pas réussi à démontrer que les lois en vigueur ne suffisaient pas à mettre un terme aux gestes illégaux. Ma question est claire. Pourquoi ce gouvernement se sert-il d'une loi aussi radicale avec comme seul objectif de protéger le leadership du premier ministre? L'honorable vice-première ministre. Monsieur le Président, Mr. ce siège et ces barrages causent des dommages importants à notre économie. La confiance internationale envers le Canada comme endroit propice au investissement et pour faire des affaires et Canada as a safe place to invest and do business. The obstruction of the ambassador bridge. The obstruction of the ambassador bridge. Interrupted trade worth $390 million a day. Those costs are real. They threaten both big and small businesses. And that is why we must take action. Mr. President, I think the Finance Minister should update the discussion. There is no longer a blockage at Windsor, Mr. President. It's finished. We don't need the emergency act. Le premier ministre a dit à plusieurs reprises que des groupes étrangers supportent les manifestations ici à Ottawa. Au comité de la sécurité publique la semaine dernière, le directeur adjoint de l'information du Centre d'analyse des opérations et déclarations financières du Canada, tout un titre, ça, a déclaré qu'il n'y avait aucune preuve pour supporter cette affirmation, ni même le début d'une piste de transaction suspecte, M. le Président. Pourquoi, pour justifier sa décision, le premier ministre invoque-t-il des faits qui n'existent pas selon ses propres experts? Business leaders in Canada know that these illegal blockades cannot go on, and they supported the necessary action our government has taken. Goldie Hyer, President of the Canada Business Council, said this week we salute this decision as a step towards bringing the illegal blockades to an end all across the country and respect for the rule of law. That's precisely what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Monsieur le Président, je lui répète, il n'y a plus de blocage aux frontières. Ça s'est réglé sans la loi des mesures d'urgence, Monsieur le Président. C'est ça la réalité. Le recours à la loi sur les mesures d'urgence, c'est une première dans l'histoire canadienne. La précédente loi, la loi sur les mesures de guerre, n'avait été étudiée que trois fois. Première guerre mondiale, deuxième guerre mondiale, pendant la crise d'octobre. Vendredi dernier, le Premier ministre disait qu'il n'y avait pas besoin d'autres mesures. Et tout d'un coup, lundi, on a invoqué la loi sur les mesures d'urgence. Bang! Est-ce que quelqu'un dans ce gouvernement Et nous dire ce qui s'est passé entre vendredi et lundi pour que le Premier ministre va sauter en seulement quelques heures. Honorable vice-premier ministre. Monsieur le Président, comme nous avons fait pendant les négociations d'Alena, notre gouvernement fera toujours ce qui est nécessaire pour protéger nos travailleurs et l'intérêt national. Nous avons défendu le Canada pendant les négociations d'Alena et maintenant nous défendons les Canadiens contre ces blocages et occupations. Illegal blockades and occupation. That's what we must do, and that is what we will keep doing. Member for South Surrey, White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister and the Emergency Preparedness Minister have repeatedly stated that foreign extremist financing is behind Canadian protests. At Public Safety Committee last week, Deputy Director of Intelligence for FinTrack, Barry McKillop stated that there is no evidence to back up these claims. In fact, he stated, quote, there has not been a spike in suspicious transactions related to the protest, end quote. Why is the Prime Minister offside with Canada's national security experts? Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I spoke yesterday with the head of FinTrack, and we are in close touch with that very important organization. The reality, her deputy, the reality, Mr. Speaker, is that FinTrack lacked the necessary authorities to oversee the new world of cryptocurrency and crowdsourcing and payment platforms. With these measures, Mr. Speaker, we have enhanced the authorities of FinTrack, and that is allowing us to stop the illegal funding of these illegal blockades. Well, member for South Surrey, White Rock. Mr. Speaker, this morning the Prime Minister contradicted two of his ministers who had stated that the application of the Emergency Measures Act would be geographically located. The PM said it would apply to all of Canada. All the border crossings in BC, Alberta, Manitoba and Ontario have been cleared. The majority of premiers clearly say this government overreach is interfering in their jurisdictions. When will the Prime Minister revoke this reckless decision and begin rebuilding the trust of Canadians? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Now, Mr. Speaker, once upon a time, the Conservative Party was a responsible party that believed in defending the national economic interest. I know one Conservative minister who served in such a government, Perrin Beatty, who created the Emergencies Act. Mr. Beatty said today, said this week, that when he brought in the Emergencies Act, he knew that there would inevitably be future crises. I spoke to Mr. Beatty today, and I told him about the work our government is doing to defend the Canadian economy. Mr. Speaker, arrest him for participants in an illegal demonstration. You don't need the Emergencies Act for that. Cutting off social funding for an illegal activity. You don't need the Emergencies Act for that either. You don't need fines. Protecting strategic infrastructure doesn't need it either. For 21 days, the means to address this crisis have been there, but for 21 days, they haven't been used. Does the government realize that all that's been missed for the past 21 days is not the Emergencies Act, it's the government's leadership, the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, business leaders from Quebec know that these illegal blockades cannot go on, and they have supported our government's action. The president of the Manufacturers and Exporters of Quebec said this week that manufacturers commend all actions that will bring an end to blockages at our borders and restore Canada's reputation as a reliable trading partner. Now, the member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, it's no joke. It's gotten to the point that the SQ here in Ottawa to save this government's skin. No one needed the Emergencies Act to resolve the blockades in Alberta, Manitoba and B.C. It wasn't needed to clear the ambassador. Le problème, c'est que le noyau de cette crise, l'État de ce Parlement fédéral, pourquoi? Parce que le gouvernement fédéral se cache depuis trois semaines. Because the federal government has been in hiding for three weeks. Don't they realize that the situation would be less dangerous today if they had taken responsibility in the first place? The Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we did take responsibility. We are taking responsibility. And I really would ask all members to be responsible, to act responsibly on behalf of the Canadians who elected them and take responsibility for democracy in Canada to protect the national interests. That is what we're doing, and that is what we will the keep member for doing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The story of this pandemic has been a story of solidarity, of Canadians taking care of one another. But Canadians are now wondering what the plan is to get out of this pandemic. We know that the plan to get out of this pandemic has to include a science-based approach, 
and it has to include an approach to invest in our health care system. So will the Prime Minister commit to making sure our health care system is never again in the fear of collapsing and that we have an evidence-based plan for us to move past this pandemic? Here, here, the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our country is moving past this pandemic thanks to the hard work, thanks to the common sense of Canadians, thanks to the fact that 90% of Canadians are vaccinated, thanks to the heroism of our health care workers and our essential workers. For that reason, Mr. Speaker, Canada has one of the best outcomes in the Western world when it comes to mortality mm -hmm. rates. Had we had the U.S. level of mortality, Mr. Speaker, an additional 66,000 Canadians would have died. We are we are getting past the pandemic thanks to Canadians. Honorable Deputy de Burnaby Sud. L'histoire de cette pandémie, c'est une histoire de solidarité. Les gens à travers les pays qui ont pris soin des uns des autres. Mais les gens sont frustrés. Ils sont frustrés parce que les problèmes dans leur vie s'empirent pendant la pandémie. C'est plus en plus difficile de trouver du logement abordable. C'est plus en plus difficile de rejoindre les deux groupes. Donc le Premier ministre s'engagera-t-il à travailler ensemble pour régler ces problèmes dans les vies des gens Honorable vice-premier ministre. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. Our government on has been working closely with municipalities and provinces and all Canadians to get a strong recovery from the COVID recession. And the good news is that Canada's GDP is now at the same level it was before COVID. We've recovered all the lost jobs. We still have some work to do, and we will do that together. Mr. President, the Prime Minister can't justify the use of the emergency act. He can't explain which tool has been used, which steps were taken before this exceptional legislation was resorted to. He can't cover up his lack of Je lui donne leadership à nouveau aujourd'hui l'occasion de nous éclairer. Quels outils, quelles like démarches a-t-il mis en place today? au cours des trois dernières semaines qui ont à ce point échoué, qui justifient so l'application de la loi sur les mesures d'urgence, M. le Président? Le Honorable ministre de la Sécurité publique. M. le Président, je remercie ma collègue pour la question. Le gouvernement apprend beaucoup des actions concrètes de début de les blocades illégales. Par exemple, on avait offert offrir plus de ressources pour les forces policières et ça c'est le résultat un peu de progrès mais en même temps les blocades a causé beaucoup de frustration pour les forces policières ça c'est une de les raisons que nous avons introduit la loi des mesures d'urgence et on va continuer d'offrir tous les outils que les services policiers besoin le député de Belchasse le président le Québec et d'autres provinces ont la situation sous contrôle sans utiliser la loi sur les mesures d'urgence. D'ailleurs, elle n'en veut pas. Act. Le they Premier ministre est prévenu d'ailleurs. Alors, ce Premier ministre qui n'écoute que lui-même et qui met en place une loi d'exception sans avoir consulté qui que ce soit, va-t-il respecter la volonté des anyone? provinces de ne pas voir cette loi appliquée sur leur territoire comme au Québec, M. le Président? Le ministre réponse courte est oui, the short bah, on avait consulté yes. avec tous les provinces We et les territoires et la manière que la loi de, de, de mesures d'urgence uh, fonctionne est en collaboration avec toutes les autorités provinciales et notre dévouement est de continuer de travailler avec les provinces et les territoires, même les municipalités et les services policiers pour terminer cette blocade, c'est le temps pour partir maintenant. Merci. L'honorable député de Richemont, Artabasca, Monsieur le Président, 
Pendant trois semaines, le premier ministre n'a rien fait. Il a mis de l'huile sur le feu en provoquant les manifestants. Il s'est même caché durant cette crise dans son chalet. Pour redorer son image, il invoque maintenant la loi sur les mesures d'urgence. Contrairement aux libéraux, les provinces ont agi et gèrent la situation de façon responsable et pacifique. Est-ce que le premier ministre peut confirmer qu'il n'utilisera pas les pouvoirs conférés par les mesures d'urgence contre le Québec et les autres provinces au Canada qui s'y opposent? L'honorable ministre. Monsieur le Président, contraire à les services policiers, a exercé beaucoup d'efforts, d'énergie pour désamorcer la situation sur le terrain. Par exemple, il y a un dialogue, même aujourd'hui, entre les polices et les membres de la blockade pour encourager de quitter maintenant. Ça, c'est la plus efficace solution. Et on va continuer d'offrir tous les ressources, tous les outils que la police a besoin. Merci. L'honorable député de Richemont, Arthabasca. Monsieur le Président, la réalité, c'est que les provinces ont suggéré la situation avec du leadership, ce qui manque du côté libéral. Le premier ministre lui invoque la loi sur les mesures d'urgence pour se décharger de ses responsabilités d'une crise qu'il a lui-même alimentée en signatisant les manifestants qui étaient ici à Ottawa. Imaginez ce premier ministre qui veut gérer la frontière entre l'Ukraine et la Russie entre les deux n'est même pas capable de gérer la rue en face du Parlement. Right here in front of Parliament. L'honorable ministre. L'honorable ministre de la Sécurité publique. Monsieur le Président, avec beaucoup de respect pour mes collègues, il n'y a aucune justification pour le blocage illégal. Aucune justification. Les débats dans cette Chambre sur la pandémie sont très importants, mais la manière que le blocage est présent maintenant dans Ottawa, même à la frontière, est inacceptable. Ça, c'est la raison que nous avons introduit le droit de mesure d'urgence pour aider les services policiers pour terminer ce Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the lack of this action from this government has resulted in the reactive to ending the protests and blockades. In invoking the measures, uh, the Emergency Measures Act is the most reactive step taken to date. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are looking for hope and for a plan. This government decided to vote against having a plan. What proactive steps did the Prime Minister actually take prior to putting in these, in, into these restrictions? None. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, we've been clear of being there every step of the way to support law enforcement as this situation continued. But I think it's important to reflect on the steps the Conservative Party took during this process, starting with the interim leader who said that I don't think that we should ask these people to go home, inferring oh, yeah. that they should take this as a political opportunity. The member for Carleton, who's a leadership aspirant, saying that I stand with the illegal activity that's occurring outside, saying that he should keep the momentum going. And of course, this continues with the member for Yorkton Melville, Saskatoon Grassland, Cypress Hills Grassland, again and again and again, they encourage the, the Honourable Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. And thank you very much, and perhaps the House Leader didn't understand. What I'm looking for is an answer to the plans and what this Prime Minister has yeah. actually done. Step one. He stigmatized, he traumatized, and he divided Canadians, just as this House Leader is doing today. Step two, he hid in the cottage. He did not react. When things were going on there, we did not hear from the Prime Minister. Step three, he whipped his caucus, where every single member, with the exception of one, voted to, against a plan. Mr. Speaker, this leadership has failed. Period. Failed. What actions did the Prime Minister actually take prior to putting in these restrictions? <laughs> The Honourable Government House Leader. Every one of us walks through uh, what is going on outside every day. We see uh, the residents of, Air of Ottawa be terrorized by this illegal occupation that's occurring. And I want to ask the members opposite, will they stand today clearly, every single one of them, and say it's time to go home? Will they stand, every single one of them, to stop tweeting, stop encouraging, stop saying things like keep the momentum going, and instead ask for those folks who are outside to go home? Home, to 
make sure that this illegal activity is not something that a party that's supposed to be standing for law and order uh, stands with. Honorable député d'Avignon, la ministre ce matin, Matapé Diard. Monsieur le Président, l'Assemblée nationale the est National unanime. Is La loi sur les mesures d'urgence, on n'en veut pas au Québec. Et même si le premier ministre avait dit Even que son décret serait localisé, bien, on constate qu'il est localisé à la grandeur du Canada. Non seulement il s'applique au Québec, mais il s'applique aux infrastructures québécoises, comme les hôpitaux, les barrages, les centres de vaccination. Mais, Monsieur le Président, il n'y a pas de crise au Québec. La preuve, on prête même la SQ à Ontario. Selon quelle logique le premier ministre croit-il nécessaire de suspendre des libertés? Necessary to suspend Québec, fundamental freedoms in Quebec just because he's lost control of the scene. The Honorable Minister of Security Public. The Minister of Public Safety. That's not how the law works. This act was introduced with charter protections and all the measures in the Order and Council will apply in a way Consistent with the charter. Thank you very much. Deputy Davignon, the Minister of Monsieur le Président, la situation est réglée au pont Ambassadeur. La situation est réglée à Côte. La situation est réglée au Manitoba. Au Québec, la situation a toujours été sous contrôle. Et juste à Ottawa, où la situation perdure directement dans la cour du Premier ministre. La crise nationale est passée. L'utilisation de la loi sur les mesures d'urgence est injustifiée. La limitation des droits fondamentaux partout au Canada est injustifiable. Alors que les opposants du Premier ministre l'accusent d'être un dictateur, ce qui est évidemment complètement faux, Réalise-t-il qu'aujourd'hui, il leur donne des arguments et que ça, c'est irresponsable? Honorable ministre, Monsieur le Président, un fait est un fait. Et le Bloc québécois ne peut pas commencer à inventer des faits ou à inventer des choses. La loi enlève aucun pouvoir aux provinces. On n'utilise pas la loi pour suspendre la, droit, la, la Charte des droits et libertés. Ce sont des mesures concrètes pour aider Québec. Si Québec en a besoin, Monsieur le Président, s'il n'y en a pas besoin, il n'y a absolument rien qui se passe, Monsieur le Président. Le Bloc le sait qu'ils sont moins honnêtes à propos de ça et arrêtent d'inventer des faits. Monsieur le Président, Mr. le Québec n'en a pas besoin et il n'en veut pas. On ne peut pas utiliser la loi sur les mesures d'urgence. Selon la loi, c'est afin de protéger les valeurs du corps politique et de garantir la souveraineté, la sécurité et l'égalité du territoire et de la sécurité et de la sécurité du pays. Mais rien de tout ça est menacé. Selon la loi, il faut être en situation de crise nationale. Ce n'est pas le cas. Et que permet la loi? Et permet, je cite à nouveau, de prendre temporairement des mesures extraordinaires, peut-être injustifiables en temps normal. Monsieur le Président, l'intégrité territoriale du Canada n'est pas menacée. Il n'y a pas de crise nationale. Alors pourquoi utiliser la loi sur les mesures d'urgence? Honorable ministre de la Sécurité publique. Parce que, Monsieur le Président, la circonstance est nécessaire. On était très clair. On n'appliquait pas ces mesures-là. Elles ne sont pas nécessaires. Je ne voudrais pas priver le Québec de ce qui est important pour assurer leur sécurité et l'intégrité de leur territoire. For public safety and territorial integrity, and it refers to the possibility of blockades at La Colle. There's a possibility of that kind of blockade this weekend in La Colle. So it's temporary and it's charter consistent. Well, earlier this week, I asked the finance minister what she was doing to control the skyrocketing cost of living. All she did was shift blame, and she avoided the question. Yesterday, we received the news that we were all dreading. Stats Canada says the Consumer Price Index rose 5.1 percent in January, the worst it's been in over 30 years. Mr. Speaker, paychecks no longer go as far as they used to, and Canadians are getting left far behind. So I will ask again, what specifically is the minister doing to get inflation under control? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Unlike the Conservatives, Canadians understand that inflation is a global phenomenon. And here are some numbers to back that up. The latest inflation number in Canada was 5.1%. In the US, it was 7.5%. In the UK, it is 
5.5%. Our inflation is lower than the G7 average, which is 5.5, the G20 average, which is 6.1, and the OECD average of 6.5%. Canadians understand, Mr. Speaker. It's time for the Conservatives to understand as well. Well, member for Abbotsford. Well, for months now, this Liberal minister has been claiming that inflation was transitory. Nothing to see here, folks. And this week, Stats Canada proved the minister wrong. Inflation is up again at 5.1%, the highest it's been over 30 years. Prices for fish up 8%, for beef up 12%, bacon 19%. How does this minister expect Canadians to put food on the table? When is this government going to realize that it has lost complete control over inflation? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. the chairman of the Federal Reserve who used the term transitory to characterize inflation. But let me just point out yet again that the Conservatives continue to push a false narrative, frankly, about everything that is happening in Canada, and very much including the economy. The fact is the Canadian recovery is strong. Our GDP grew by 5.4% in the third quarter. That beat the U.S., Japan, the U.K., and Australia. And I also want to point out that S&P and Moody's both reaffirmed our AAA credit rating this fall. Honorable Deputy de Louis Saint Laurent. Monsieur le Président, il y a trois semaines, on parlait de l'inflation. Savez-vous ce que la ministre des Finances m'avait dit? Il n'y a pas de problème parce que c'est un problème mondial. Puis aussi, le FMI dit que le Canada va bien, puis le PIB augmente. Wow! Ça, c'est convaincant, Monsieur le Président. Résultat aujourd'hui, l'inflation continue d'augmenter à 5,1 Le bœuf coûte 12 plus cher, le sage 30 plus cher, le logement 6 plus. Ça, c'est la réalité des Canadiens. Mais l'autre réalité, Monsieur le Président, c'est que le gouvernement ne fait strictement rien. Monsieur le Président, pour vous, est-ce que la ministre des Finances pourrait mettre de côté le FMI et parler directement de la réalité qui frappe les Canadiens? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we will not be lectured by the Conservatives when it comes to helping Canadians, the most vulnerable Canadians, deal with the cost of living. We have implemented uh, index benefits that have helped some 300,000 children through the child benefit to get out of poverty. Mr. Speaker, Canada is one of the biggest funders of oil and gas in the G20. A new study showed that last year alone, the government through Export Development Canada handed out $4.4 billion, earning Canada the worst possible climate score. That's despite repeated Liberal promises to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. We are in a climate emergency and EDC is fueling the crisis. So why I won't did, this government know, and, but it make didn't EDC it. clean up its act, stop I'm, I'm so order, order. I'm sorry. That, that was a, that was a technical error where somebody had their microphone on. I'm going to ask the honourable member for Victoria to start from the top so that we can hear her full question. The honourable member for Victoria. Mr. Speaker, Canada is one of the biggest funders of oil and gas in the G20. A new study showed that last year alone, the government, through Export Development Canada, handed out $4.4 billion, earning Canada the worst possible climate score. That's despite repeated Liberal promises to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. We are in a climate emergency, and EDC is fueling the crisis. So why won't the government make EDC clean up its act, stop giving billions to big oil and gas, and start standing up for Canadians. Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for her question. In fact, G20 countries have committed to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies by 2025. We in Canada have committed to doing that by 2023. 
two years earlier than our G20 colleagues, Mr. Speaker. And on top of that, EDC has reduced its fossil fuel subsidies by more than $3 billion per year since 2018. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Earlier this week, I made an accusation against the Environment Minister that his government had held 370 backroom meetings with big oil in just two years. Mr. Speaker, I withdraw those comments. Because it turns out they'd actually rolled out the red carpet for 1,224 meetings with big oil. That, my friends, is the definition of carbon captured. So it's no wonder that under this Prime Minister, Canada has fallen to the bottom of the G7 in terms of climate action. So to the Environment Minister, when's he going to stop acting as the head butler for the oil lobby and start standing up for Canadians? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank my Honourable for his question. One of the highest carbon price in the world here in Canada. Regulations on methane pollution, 40% reduction by 2025. A cap on oil and gas emissions. These are all things our government has done to fight climate change and ensure we create good jobs and a prosperous future for all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, this Tuesday, 54 potential unmarked graves were found at Kisikusi First Nation. Three weeks ago, Williams Lake First Nation announced that a survey had identified 93 potential unmarked graves on the site of the former St. Joseph Mission Residential School. Nearly a year ago, Canada was rocked by the discovery of 200 probable unmarked graves on the grounds of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. Despite all this evidence, some still deny the actual le legacy of residential schools and claim the number of unmarked graves is exaggerated. Mr. Speaker, I find this very troubling and unacceptable. Could the Minister of Crown and Indigenous Relations com Mr. comment Mr. on what our government is doing to support the survivors of these residential schools? Appel au règlement, s'il vous plaît. Il n'y a pas de rappel au règlement s'il n'y a pas quelque chose de technique qui se passe. Je veux rappeler aux gens qu'il y a de l'accommodation qui se fait dans la Chambre. And I just want to say that there is accommodation that takes place in the Chamber. Sometimes, technically, it doesn't always work. I believe we had everything tested that worked out fairly well. I believe the translation took place. La traduction prend place. Alors, si vous n'entendez pas la traduction, s'il vous plaît, laissez-moi le, le savoir. Est-ce que la traduction s'est arrêtée? Non. Alors, s'il vous plaît, un peu de, de... A little bit of understanding, a little bit of compassion, so that we can all work together in the House. The Honourable Minister. Last summer, in light of the devastating findings in Kamloops and Kawasis, our government announced an additional $329 million to support Indigenous communities in their search for loved ones robbed at such a young age, in their efforts to memorialize their loss and their quest for closure. Residential schools were a reality in this country for well over 150 years, and the effects are still felt painfully today. To the survivors who are speaking out, including my friend and member who spoke, as well as those who continue to suffer in silence, we believe you, Canada believes you. The Honourable Member for Fort McMurray Cold Lake. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is out of step with Canadians. Canadians want and deserve open dialogue after two years of uncertainty. This should be about science, not political science, yet this Prime Minister would rather divide and stigmatize instead of giving people the certainty and hope they need. When will the Prime Minister stop doubling down on divisive rhetoric and commit publicly to a specific plan and timeline to end federal mandates and restrictions? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since day one of this pandemic, our government's focus has been the health and safety of our, of our neighbours by following the latest science. The most recent data indicates that the Omicron wave has passed its peak in Canada, which allows us to move towards a more long-term approach to managing COVID-19. We intend to follow the science, and we're working closely with experts like Dr. Tam and other public health officials to ensure that we continue to get through this pandemic together as best we possibly can, and that has been through vaccinations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's petulance led to the firing of Ottawa's first black police chief during Black History Month. It's yet another example of the divisiveness fostered by this government. The Prime Minister's own finance minister stood on the Maidan during Ukraine's revolution. Canadians want foreign interference from the Prime Minister's jet-setting resetters to stop. When will the Prime Minister listen to the majority of freedom-loving Canadians and end the mandates? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I've had, and I'm sure all members have had, the opportunity to talk to people who come from countries that aren't free, that know what it means to have their freedoms restricted in ways that are not able to live or to share their thoughts or to protest in peaceful ways. But I'm sure, and I would hope, that the member opposite would agree that what we're seeing outside, the terrorizing of residents, the harassing of homeless shelters, the inability for Ottawa citizens to continue their life has gone way too far. Are. Please stop supporting these illegal activities and join with us so that our lives can begin to return to normal. The Honourable Member for Bow River. Mr. Speaker, the science has changed. Canada's top officials, including Dr. Tam, have recommended a review of COVID policies. We're seeing countries around the world with lower vaccination rates in Canada dropping the restrictions. We're seeing provinces in our own country dropping the restrictions. Is the government going to stick to its word and follow the science? When will the mandates for Canadian travellers who are fully vaccinated and when will the mandates be totally dropped for the testing for Canadian travellers to return? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, this transition, including this week's announcement, is possible because of a number, number of factors, which includes our high vaccination rates and the increasing availability of rapid tests and treatments. As we've said all along, Canada's border measures will remain flexible and adaptable, guided by science and prudence. I have a quote from my, uh, my colleague opposite, and that is, it starts here. Everyone entering Canada by land as well as by air, irrespective of their vaccination status, will be required to take a rapid test or possibly a PCR test. Where's that from? That's from page 19 of the Conservatives' election platform. Remember this magazine? That one. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the Honourable Member for New Brunswick Southwest. Well, Mr. Speaker, life moves on and the government needs to move on with it. In December, the Liberals again imposed rigid COVID-19 testings on Canadians living in border communities who travel to the United States and return home, often within a day or within a few hours. The, Lib the Liberals announced they would replace 72-hour PCR testing with a 24-hour rapid test. This doesn't help our border communities. 24-hour testing will continue to separate families and people in Canada's border towns. When will the Liberals allow Canadians to drive to the United States and come home in a single day without testing? Here Thank you, are. Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd remind the member again that uh, you campaigned on testing as well, just like we did. Uh, well, we're in a better position today than we were previously. This pandemic's not over yet. We all want this pandemic to be over, but it's not over yet. The Government of Canada will continue to assess the evolving situation here at home and globally, and while the members opposite continue to Shout, shout me down. It doesn't change the, re the, the reality that this pandemic is not yet over. Thank you, members. Honorable Deputy de Joliette. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Le gouvernement s'est donné le pouvoir exceptionnel de geler les comptes de banque des personnes puis des entreprises dont les camions entravent le centre-ville d'Ottawa. C'est dans la loi ces mesures d'urgence qui est en vigueur depuis le 14 février. Or, on est rendu le 17. Ma question est simple. Combien de comptes de banque d'occupants d'Ottawa ont été gelés depuis trois jours? L'honorable vice-premier ministre. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président, et merci you, pour la question. Uh, pendant une conférence de aujourd'hui, euh, j'ai confirmé que nous avons commencé d'utiliser les outils euh, dans les règles d'urgence et que les comptes sont maintenant gelés, mais à cause de la sécurité des opérations de la force de la sécurité, on ne peut pas aujourd'hui donner les chiffres. On va les donner le plus vite possible. Honorable député de Joliette. Merci, M. le Président. La vérité, c'est que le pouvoir de geler les comptes 
comptes de banque des participants à une manifestation illégale. Le gouvernement l'a depuis le début. Il n'y a pas besoin de la mesure d'urgence. Il peut déjà le faire en vertu de la loi sur le recyclage des produits de la criminalité et le financement des activités terroristes. Ça fait donc 21 jours que le fédéral peut geler les fonds des occupants qui assiègent Ottawa. Donc, je répète ma question encore parce que nous, en Chambre, on veut avoir les chiffres, combien de comptes de banque ont été gelés pour essayer de régler la situation avant que ça vire en confrontation. L'honorable vice-première ministre. Monsieur le Président, avant l'utilisation de les mesures d'urgence, c'était très, c'était impossible de partager toutes les informations entre les forces national et local et municipal de la sécurité et les Avant l'utilisation des mesures d'urgence, on n'a pas eu la possibilité d'obliger les banques à faire ces choses. Ces outils financiers sont importants. On a besoin de ces outils financiers. Monsieur le Speaker, 23 Liberal MPs requestent de aider les Afghan réfugiés qui ignorés. Liberal ministers were briefed months before Kabul fell. These warnings were ignored. My letters to the Prime Minister and the ministers continue to be ignored. Afghan refugees write to this government every day pleading for help. They continue to be ignored. The Afghan crisis is another pattern of inaction and failures in leadership by this Liberal government. Why was an, action, why was an election plan and abandoning those that served Canada more important than the pleas of Afghan refugees? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, when that member first asked me a question about the success of our resettlements and uh, efforts in Afghanistan, there was 3,800 Afghan refugees in Canada. Today, there are more than 7,700. In the past few weeks, Mr. Speaker, we have seen more than 460 arrive on 20 commercial flights. There are more flights arriving every week. We have made one of the most substantial commitments of any country in the world, not just on a per capita basis, but in terms of the raw number of human beings that we are going to welcome to give a second lease on life. Canadians should be proud of the effort that we're making, and we will not waver until we are successful in resettling all 40,000 Afghan refugees who will call Canada home. The Honourable Deputy de Charbon, Haute Saint Charles. Monsieur le Président, ça n'explique pas pourquoi, qu'en décembre 2020, 23 députés libéraux ont supplié le Premier ministre de prendre action afin de sauver les ressortissants afghans qui avaient aidé les Canadiens pendant le conflit en Afghanistan. Ça a pris huit mois. Et après huit mois, il est arrivé quoi? L'ambassade a fermé, later, tout le monde est parti, puis il s'est rien passé. Là, aujourd'hui, on nous garage un chiffre. 40 000 Afghans vont s'en venir ici. Mais jamais il n'y a été question come. spécifiquement d'aider les Afghans qui nous avaient aidés sur le territoire par le conflit en Afghanistan, par le qu'on était là. Pourquoi ces personnes-là n'ont pas été prises en charge lorsque les députés libéraux l'ont demandé au Premier ministre? appreciate that during the evacuation there was an emergency situation and we responded as quickly as was humanly possible. One of the reasons, Mr. Speaker, that I think the Honourable Member will appreciate is that we no longer had a military presence with the logistics capability of moving thousands and thousands of people on our own because we hadn't had a military presence there since 2014. Mr. Speaker, we worked with international partners to rescue thousands of people in the moments of the evacuation. I want to say thank you to my predecessor, now the Minister of Public Safety, for his efforts to resettle thousand of Afghan refugees, and I'm going to finish the job. The Honourable Member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Mr. Speaker, here is some of the damning testimony this week from retired generals about the Liberal government's failure during the fall of Kabul and the government's continued lack of leadership. Quote, we were the first embassy to depart. That was very embarrassing. Quote, when this crisis was unfolding right in front of our eyes, we had then, as we do now, urged the government to create an interdepartmental task force with one leader. Mr. Speaker, I'll ask the same question I asked last week. Will the Prime Minister assign one lead minister to solve this ongoing humanitarian aid crisis? The Honourable Parliamentary... Oh, sorry. The Honourable... 
Minister of Immigration. I, I am the minister who's been appointed by the Prime Minister to lead this effort. We will collaborate with other ministers, including the Minister of Global Affairs, to help ensure that we are successful in partnering with the global community to see this mission succeed. I heard the members opposite heckling about the timing of the election when it came to the Afghan refugee resettlement effort. And I would point out how important that election was because we campaigned on a commitment to increase our level of ambition from 20,000 to 40,000. Their commitment on the other side, while they heckle me, was to welcome precisely zero Afghan refugees. More than that, Mr. Speaker, they campaigned to end the government-assisted refugees program altogether, which has been responsible for saving thousands of lives. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Hier, cette Chambre a entamé le débat à la deuxième lecture du projet de loi sur la diffusion continue en ligne. Pendant le débat, certains collègues de l'opposition ont soulevé des questions intéressantes, même si d'autres ont pratiqué leur discours pour la course à la chefferie. Est-ce que le, le ministre du patrimoine canadien peut nous informer de ce que le projet de loi C-11 propose de faire et ne pas faire? Le ministre du patrimoine canadien. Alors, Monsieur le Président, je remercie ma collègue pour son travail absolument extraordinaire ainsi que la qualité de sa question. Vraiment, c'est très fort. L'objectif du projet de loi, Monsieur le Président, c'est de s'assurer que les compagnies de streaming investissent dans la culture canadienne, dans notre culture. Point. Et concrètement, bien, ça veut dire plus d'artistes canadiens plus de films, plus de séries, plus de musique de chez nous. Et avec ce projet de loi-là, on bâtit les fondations de la prochaine, les prochaines générations de créateurs canadiens. Alors, les prochains week-ends, les prochains Denis Villeneuve, le prochain District 31. Et on a introduit ce projet de loi parce qu'on est fiers de notre culture, fiers de qui nous sommes et fiers de notre identité, M. le Président. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals' main in Canada housing crisis has gotten out of control. It's the same situation across the country, including my community of York Simcoe. Working Canadians have been priced out of the housing market with no hope in sight. Now, home builders are stopping the construction of new homes. Liberal inflation has caused prices for material to skyrocket. Right. There are too many ways for builders. There is no way for builders to know the fair market value of the home that won't be ready for at least two years. Why is this Liberal government making it even harder for Canadians to own a home? Great question. Minister for Housing. The Conservatives are not really serious about housing affordability because every single time we've brought a measure here to enable Canadians to be able to afford a home, they voted against it. The first time home buyer incentive, all the measures that we've brought. They even voted against imposing a vacancy tax on foreign-owned non-resident properties. So they're not serious. They're full of rhetoric and Canadians see through them. We will take additional measures to improve the first-time home buyer incentive and, and turn more Canadian renters into homeowners. Let's see if they vote against that. The Honourable Member for Yellowhead. Mr. Speaker, 400 billion newly created cash has driven up consumer prices and constituents in my riding, especially seniors, can't afford their basic necessities. In addition to rising consumer prices, electricity and heating bills are increasing due to the carbon tax, which is to increase again on April 1st. Mr. Speaker, when will this Liberal government finally quit making false promises and create a real economic plan for all Canadians, especially those who are struggling to meet their basic needs? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservative MP began his question talking about government spending, which he seems to deem excessive. So I'd like to remind him that he, together with every single Conservative there, actually ran on an election platform proposing higher spending in 21-22 than the Liberals did. They proposed a $168 billion deficit. We proposed a $156 billion deficit. So could the party of flip-flops tell Canadians what they stand for today? The Honourable Member for Brantford Brant. Mr. Speaker, with more than 1.3 million unemployed Canadians, 200,000 jobs were lost in January alone. At the same time, our businesses are struggling to fill almost 1 million jobs. Canada's economic recovery is in jeopardy. Canada has the fifth worst job recovery in the G7. Hardworking people of Brantford Brant are asking, 
when will the Prime Minister stop putting his ideological agenda above prudent economic decisions? Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it is a bit rich to hear the Conservatives talk about their support for Canadian workers and Canadian jobs. And let me just point out one moment of abject Conservative failure, and that was before Christmas. When we knew, we knew Omicron was coming, we knew Canadian workers and businesses needed support, but you know what? The Conservatives voted against that measure. And when it comes to jobs, Canada has recovered 101% of the jobs lost to COVID. U.S. just 87%, Mr. Speaker. Ball member for London West. Mr. Speaker, some working low-income seniors in this country have had a challenging time making ends meet uh, during this pandemic, which is why they turned to what most Canadians did, the CRB and other pandemic benefits. While we're going to be supporting people who suffered drops in their GIS and allowance through co compensation payments, the Minister of Seniors' mandate letter also called us to look, to look forward. It called us to assure seniors that we'd have their backs even more. Can the Minister tell this House how she's done that? Honourable Minister for Seniors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for London West for her question and for her advocacy for seniors in her riding. She's right. We committed to ensuring seniors' eligibility for the GIS and Alliance will not be impacted by receiving pan pandemic benefits. And this House yesterday, Mr. Speaker, unanimously passed Bill C-12. And I want to take an opportunity to thank every member in this House in making that happen. I look forward to seeing it make its way through the other place. Mr. Speaker, it's clear for seniors with the greatest needs that we will always have their backs. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, 1.5 million Ukrainians have been displaced from their homes since Russia invaded in 2014. Now, as Russia amasses troops and armaments and threatens further invasion, the Ukrainian people need Canada more than ever. There is a looming humanitarian disaster in Ukraine and thousands of Ukrainians are seeking refuge in Canada. We saw this government fail to protect Afghans. We can't let this happen again. Will the minister uphold Canada's responsibility to Ukrainians? Will the minister ensure humanitarian aid and better support for those Ukrainians who are fleeing violence? Well, uh, minister, or the Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there is no situation that is we are more seized with right now than Ukraine and our solidarity for the Ukrainian government and the people of Ukraine. We have also been very clear that we are standing with Canadian citizens who are in Ukraine and any possible humanitarian crisis that could extend following a possible incursion. Right now, however, our mission is to de-escalate Russia's uh, uh, total uh, disrespect for the territorial integrity of Ukraine. We will stand with the people of Ukraine, whether it's militarily, whether it is uh, humanitarian assistance, and by helping uh, every Ukrainian who is in trouble. The Honourable Member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recently met with representatives from the undergraduates of Canadian research intensive universities. They represent over a quarter million students from U15 universities that annually conduct eight and a half billion dollars of research and contribute more than $36 billion to our economy. Like most students I meet with in Spadina, Fort York, there's a shared concern, crippling student debt. The average lifetime interest on a Canadian student loan is $3,000. Due to the pandemic, the government waived the interest for two years. Mr. Speaker, more must be done. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Disability Inclusion inform this House when will the government permanently eliminate interest on Canada student loans? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable colleague for his uh, question. Young Canadians and students must be at the centre of our recovery, and we're proud that our response during the pandemic was one of the largest youth support packages in the world. During the pandemic, our government waived the interest on Canada student loans and Canada apprentice loans for two years because we knew young people were amongst the hardest hit by job losses. That's why we are committed to permanently eliminating the federal interest on CSL and Canada apprentice loans, supporting over 1 million students. We're also committed to increasing the repayment assistance threshold to $50,000 for Canada student loan borrowers. We will continue to be there, Mr. Speaker, to help Canadians transition into the workforce. Thank you.